Strap yourself in. Wood were prohibited. Not available in the state of shock. Hey, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Drum Talk TV. We're here with Mark Shulman in our Performance Master Series. However, Mark also crosses over into the Master Educator Series and into the Session Master Series. We'll get all into the different types of work that he does. He's got a book coming out that we'll touch on, um, some cool camps coming out that you can tap into. Um, he's had worldwide experience touring, recording, and he's a classically trained cellist. That goes with drumming, right? Mark, how are you? I'm doing great, Dan. How are you doing, buddy? I'm doing great. But it's very it? nice to, to finally see you. We grew up like two blocks from each other. And in, in honor in of her, you, I'm wearing a vintage Hang 10 t-shirt, by the way. Nice. To honor our childhood having grown up near the beach. In, in the Los valley. Angeles. In the valley. Yeah, we're both valley boys. We hardly knew each other back then, but here we are getting to know each other. I think we got to know each other more in the last hour on the phone than we ever have. <laughs> yeah, right. Hey, it's never, it's never too late to learn to love somebody, right? That's right. Absolutely. So, Mark, the first thing I want to ask you is um, for up-and-coming drummers, and that doesn't necessarily mean young drummers, but any drummers that are out there working hard to get beyond <laughs> that weekend warrior status and really look for some good, serious work out there, with your experience, you play with Cher, you've toured worldwide with Pink, you've played with Foreigner, on and on, you know, a great roster of artists who you've played with. What advice do you have for people to try to get, not necessarily superstardom connection work right away, but just enough work, hopefully, to work as a drummer full-time? I mean, personally, folks, I'd rather make $30,000 as a drummer full-time than working at the grocery store if I had the opportunity. It's not always about the money, but doing what you love. What advice do you have for that, Mark? Well, there's a saying in the business world that they say, your net work is your net worth. So I think that it's critical to expand your network of friends, communication, um, as much as you possibly can, because there's there's so many components to success, and if there were a formula you could you could bottle up, you would make millions. The reality is that that, that is not a reality. Um, the reality is that the more people you know, and the more people that you are of service to, the greater your chances of connecting up with the types of gigs and the type of people that you actually want to be working with. And so I always tell my students and anybody I meet, and even myself, I remind myself, you need to constantly expand your network because, you know, there's, there, there's a certain amount of chance to this game and a certain amount of luck to this game. But when given that opportunity, I always just say, give me the opportunity and I will make the most out of it. And then if I'm the right guy for the gig, great. If I'm not, great. Because there are auditions that I didn't get and there are auditions I did get. And as a matter of fact, one of the auditions I failed early on in my career became the inspiration, the impetus for me to write my new book, which we'll talk about a little later. But over the years, I've developed a network of people. And as you develop a network of people, people begin to trust you. And what I've realized is often in our business, people will hire somebody they know and they trust over somebody that might be, quote unquote, better qualified as a player because they have a connection. They've created that communication. They've created that trust. And that trust has more value than the amount of notes someone's playing. So that's the biggest thing. And, I mean, I used to, like, early in my career, I'd go and I'd see what new records were coming out. To, if I figured out, well, if a new, a new artist has got a new record, that means they may be putting together a band. Then I try to find out the management company. With the Internet as a resource, there's so much information you could find out. And you just you can't be shy, and you also have to be willing to weed through all of the no's. You know, there's a no and some no, and this doesn't have an oh, no, no. But then you get that one yes, and you're like, wait a minute, I got a yes. Look at this, I got a yes. And you put that in your pocket and use those small wins as motivators for you to continue moving forward. And remember, we don't work music, we play music. It's a gift, it's a passion, it's something that we get to do as opposed to something that we have to do. So. Anything that you can do to stimulate your motivation, anything you can do to meet people, anything you can do to be of service. Because 
you know, if you're watching this, you're probably a drummer. And drummer, drummers, man, we're the coolest people on the planet, dude. You know, we take care. We're the foundation. We're like the the concrete, you know, that everything is built upon. So always look at yourself as a bit of a shepherd, if you will, of everybody else. And always say, what can I do? What can I do to be of service to you? And be the one that listens. Because if you're the one that listens, you're the one that will get hired. Because everybody likes to talk, especially guitar player. <laughs> hey, you, you said some wonderful things in that in, advice. I want to touch on three of them. One of them has to do with, you know, you just need the opportunity and be prepared. And, you know, sometimes there's luck involved. And l the definition of luck is opportunity meeting preparedness. And that fits in exactly with your story. And, you know, you talk about weeding through the nose, putting up with the nose. The, folks, the most important sales job that any of us will ever have, and you may have a job where you're not in sales, you are your biggest product, your most important product, and the most important sales job you'll ever have is selling yourself. And when Mark talks about um, being hired by someone because there's a connection and you know them personally and building trust, that's why behavior and building your brand in the right light is so important. Correct, Mark? Yes. You are the brand. I, I mean, I am a brand. Dan is a brand. This drum talk is a brand. Everything is a brand. And everything has value and everything has net worth. And you need to make sure that you have a very clear understanding of your value and a clear understanding of your assets. Because when you do get that opportunity, you want to be able to seize that opportunity and slam it. Because that's what's happened with me and that's what's happened with mo most people's experiences that have had success and really high, high level success in this business, they were given the opportunity. And when they got that one opportunity, they kicked ass. And even early in my career, though, as I said, I, I failed an audition miserably. I failed a bad English audition back in the late 80s um, for two reasons. One is I was speeding up. I, you know, my, my internal sense of time was just not developed yet, although I thought it was. The other one is I was overwhelmed with anxiety and nervousness. And that ended up becoming the impetus for my book, which is called Nerve Breaker, Conquering Life Stage Fright. But at the time, I thought my career was over and it hadn't even started. The reality was, I got my ass kicked, I learned what I needed to learn, and then I got busy developing my capability. And I got busy, you know, it, there were two things. One is I had a moment of clarity after that audition and I realized, wow, there's, I have two goals here. One is that I want nobody to ever tell me I'm speeding up or slowing down unless I want to speed up or slow down. So I clocked thousands of hours doing a rhythm course, actually with a teacher, Tom Mendola, who still does it. So if you're in Los Angeles, study with Tom, he's great. And I worked with a click track, a metronome, just clapping for months and then slowly adding beats and then fills and all these different tempos. And the goal is to be able to cancel out the click, to not be able to hear the metronome for one minute at a time at every tempo. Because you're so entrained, you're so synchronized that you're locked in. And that's how you develop your internal sense of time. And I just worked and worked and worked and worked. And from that day, nobody's ever, been t nobody's ever told me I'm speeding up or slowing down unless I want to speed up or slow down. There's nothing wrong with that. It's just having the capability to control it. And then yeah. the second vow I made to myself was I would bust my nerves and fear into submission. So I spent the next 20 years analyzing, studying, researching, networking, and discovering until I uncovered the habits and rituals that have allowed me to bust through my fear both on and off the stage. And that was the impetus for Nerve Breakers, my book. But the concept is you've got to be just fearless. And let's put a positive focus. That's a negative goal. Your positive goal is you need to be willing to do whatever it takes and talk to whomever it takes to be able to advance your career forward and be of service to people. Because musicians notoriously say, you know, they'll lock themselves in the practice room and they'll develop all of these chops, yet they're not out marketing and promoting themselves. It's like right. you had Coca-Cola, you know, which is the most successful soft drink of all time, but you didn't have anybody branding and marketing it. Nobody would give a shit. Who cares if it's yeah. The, who cares what it tastes like and how great it is or what it can do for you and how refreshing this product is. They would never get to that market. You ain't nothing. And so you need to be really just completely aware that you have the control over that. 
And and another interesting thing is a lot of times you'll be, you know, hitting the pavement and calling and calling and calling. You go, man, I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere, but you are. Because what's happened with me is I will hit the pavement and call and call and call, and it seems like almost every time I just get frustrated and think, oh, this is leading to nothing, something taps me on the back. Somebody taps me on the back. And the opportunity is there. It just might come in a different form, in a different time, from different people than you expected. But the universe responds to the work that you put into it. Yes. So you always have to know that even though it feels like you're not getting anywhere, I think metaphysically speaking, and in reality, you are because you're building this brand and you never know where that opportunity will come from once you've done the work. I can't, you can't expect the opportunity to come if you haven't done the work, but if you've done the work, the opportunity will come. And it can come from anywhere. Yeah, and Mark, when you say when you get the opportunity, tell everyone that when you say when you get the opportunity, it's time to kick ass, you don't just mean playing. You mean, as you said before, in your behavior, how can I be of service, be the listener. That's one of the biggest things. There's a million great drummers, but people want to work with people they can indeed work with, right? Yeah. you And remember, as I said earlier as well, you're the foundation. I look at drummers as we're, we're a very interesting and lovable sort, we drummers. Matter of fact, here, a quick little story. So years ago, there was an amazing drummer in town that he will go unnamed because to, to protect the innocent. But I, I, called, him. I called him up and I said, dude, can, will you teach me some of your licks? Can we get together? Because I knew he had a studio and he was in town. Said, yeah, man, come over. I'll, I'll make you dinner. I think, wow, drummers, incredibly giving people. And then at the time, I was also um, single. And he says, and he had a really gorgeous girlfriend, right? So he says, dude, come on over. I'll introduce you to my girlfriend's best friend. She's hot. I'm like, wow, there's an end. Drummers, such giving people. And then he says, you know what, man? I'll tell you what. If you don't like her, take my girlfriend. Drummers, giving people. Did you feel your net worth going up, down, or sideways at that point? Going way up. So remember that we are the foundation, and, you know, we're, we're unique how many, you know, drummers get together, we're, we're, we're community oriented, you know, yeah. you'll get 100, 200 people, drummers at a, at, a, at a drum clinic, guitar players, bass players, contra percent players, they don't act the same way. Right. You know, we have this sort of foundational, tribal, pulse, heartbeat, we are the foundation, so I always feel like it's part of my gig to just take care, and I say shepherd the rest of the people, shepherd the band, be the foundation. There's a, I just read this article about drummers' brains. The drummers' brains are have a superiority in our ability to problem solve because of the way that we sort of do this combination of, of mathematics and creativity in our brains makes us special. We are special. Embrace it. Embrace your uniqueness, drummers. Yes, absolutely, and build your brand around that. Um, tell us about the book. What can you tell us about it? What are you able to tell us about it? Well, as I, I told you the history of how it began, right. I ended up deciding, I realized at one point that I had played for nearly a billion people in my life. I had transcended or, or learned how to harness, manage, tame the anxiety and the fear in multiple areas of my life, actually. And I thought, I'm going to write a book. And then my wife said, well, why don't you interview other people for the book and find out their secrets, their stories. And I thought, well, what a brilliant idea. Thank you, Lisa. So I interviewed nearly 50 people, like top performers in all areas of life. Everybody from Stuart Copeland, the drummer for the, for the police, to uh, Tony Shea, the CEO of Zappos, to actor Jeremy Piven, to Eric Weinmeyer, the blind climber of Mount Everest, astronaut Alan Bean, um, a managing editor for Fortune magazine, a gal who wrote the foreword to my book, Lee Gallagher, and I found out secrets and stories, and, and these people actually endorsed my nerve breakers, and I have three foundational nerve breakers that are so simple that if you employ them in your life, I basically guarantee if you read my book that you're going to raise your level of confidence and be able to harness, tame, manage your, your, your performance anxiety, and it applies across the board, not only to, per, to, to musical performance, but communication, talking to your boss giving a speech, conducting an office meeting, asking somebody out on a date. You know, in these moments of anxiety where you just simply know you didn't perform at your best, how can you do it the next time around? And that's what I touch on. And I did a lot of research 
and try to take all this research and simplify it with some great stories. And there's there's exercises you can do after every chapter. It's it's a very comprehensive study of managing taming fear and turning it into confidence, transforming awesome. it into confidence or building your level of confidence. Yeah, that's something that anybody in any industry and really in any position of any company or in life can certainly use. When that does come out, we'll push it out there on the Drum Talk TV. Sounds great. Yeah, I think everybody would really enjoy it. I'm, I, um, getting a lot of wonderful feedback, even though it's technically not available yet. <laughs> but it will be. That's great. Um, if you don't mind, I want to ask something a little bit more personal. I think a lot of people know that you are a cancer survivor. Yeah. We've, we've done work with April Samuels, who most of the people know about who follow our show. April Samuels was a survivor of triple negative breast cancer, yeah. survived a double mastectomy and a punctured lung in the process of being treated for it. And now she's out there doing wonderful benefits that we're a part of every October. And um, I thought it'd be great for people to hear some of your story when we go from what your book is about to anxiety everyone has their own thing whatever it is that they reach for for strength and to just sort of get them through can you talk about what got you through the scariest moments of that mark because there's always someone somewhere either going through that or related to someone that is and i'm hoping that your your words of wisdom from your experience could help them absolutely well a couple things. I mean, in 1995, I was out with Simple Minds, you know, the band, Don't You Forget About Me. Breakfast I just Club. The record and I was doing a tour. We were doing an arena tour. And um, drummers are like athletes. You know, we burn as many calories as a professional soccer player, according to Clem Burke's study, the drummer from Blondie. And we have our aches and pains. I've had all kinds of aches and pains my whole life, but mostly upper body. But I made it through this tour, and... Uh, about right before the tour ended, I woke up in the morning and I had a pain, but it was in my crotch of all places, kind of like my right testicle. And I thought, well, maybe it's a hernia. I didn't know what it was. Called my doctor. He booked me an appointment. So I was, I got home 10 days later and I went to see a urologist and the urologist was checking out the painful testicle, which as you know, gentlemen, is you just, you know, getting your, your balls checked. It's not fun to begin with, but this was like, oh my Lord, incredibly painful. And then he checks the other testicle. And he looks perplexed when he checks the other testicle. Then he checks the painful one and then checks the other one. And he looks a little concerned. He says, you know, the one that was, the one that's painful, that's a pretty common infection. And I'll, I'll give you some antibiotics and you should be over that in the next five days. But this left testicle feels lumpy, like out of the blue. So he had a sonogram, and you know, the, the, what they use for the pregnant women's like bellies. So sonograms my testicle. And he sees a lump in there, and he goes, quick, get dressed and come to my office. And I get dressed, come to his office, he says, Mark, I've got bad news. He said, I've seen this many times before. I'm about 99% sure you have a cancerous seminoma tumor in your left testicle, the one that wasn't hurting. And I'm just wow. so numb. This whole experience is like, oh, my God. Like, First of all, it, you know, what if I hadn't had the pain in the other test? Right. Messages come to us in mysterious ways. Sometimes. Mysterious ways. And, and, you know, I, so he said, you know, book, book, you got to come in. I got to remove your left testicle. I want you to get abdominal radiation to increase your chances of survival by another 5%. And I'm like, all this information, and it literally put me in shock. And I, and I made an appointment to come in two days later and I had my testicle removed. But then when I left that day, you know, tears in my eyes and this wave of fear coming over me, um, I kind of stopped outside the, the doctor's office, kind of in the parking lot, looking at the trees, and I said, you know, all we have is now. Yeah. And that's when I determined at that moment that life is a series of nows. Because the past doesn't exist. I mean, the past exists in music and literature and movies and in our memories, in which really suck, basically. And then I thought, well, Wow. And then I had like another moment of clarity and I realized right at that moment, I was feeling really good. I was feeling really optimistic and I realized I, I had the capability, I had the ability to shift my attitude right then in that moment. And by shifting my attitude, I could shift my behavior. By changing my behavior, I'm actually changing the consequences, the results of my life. And I come to learn later that this is a phenomenon. ABC that I learned from my one of my mentors, dear friends, Dr. Jim Samuels. Your attitude controls your behavior, and behavior can control the consequences. ABC, and I was realizing that at the moment, and it really empowered me. And 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 then I, I tapped into one of my quick 
nerve breakers, which is gratitude, the attitude of gratitude. Because I then also came to realize that you can't have a positive and negative conscious thought at the same time. And we don't realize that. But if you shift your attitude, you can control your attitude. You can't control what happens to you, but you can control your attitude about what happens to you. Right. And gratitude is an amazingly empowering conscious thought because when you're focused on gratitude, you focus on what you have, the money in the bank, the fuel in the tank, and you just draw on that gratitude for that moment, whatever you, you're thankful for, your, your kids, your career, just to be alive. And that moment right then can be the greatest moment of your life. And so I literally shifted from complete fear to this moment of gratitude where I just felt all this joy just to be alive and just to be present. And I realized I actually do have control and power over how I think, even though I don't have control and power over what might happen to my body. Right. And, you, and, and when, you, when I've read about people that have been, you know, some people that have been in concentration camps and prisoners of war, and you come to realize that some of these people are some of the most joyful people because they realize at some point that the most horrendous things have happened to them, but they can actually control their attitude, their perception about it. And that has empowered me and continues to empower me throughout my life when I've had struggles. And, you know, I was married before my ex-wife, Kelly, had cancer, our whole relationship. My cancer came right in the middle of her cancer. It was like the most amazing story that's stranger than fiction. It's the last chapter of my book, actually, I donated to this rock and roll cancer story that would, no one would actually believe. So that's a little bit of insight into what I do and how I deal with it. And if you want to read a lot more, read my book, Nerve Breakers, Conquering Life Stage Fright. It's awesome, Mark, because, first of all, thank you for that. I know there's people that will benefit from that everywhere because you're demonstrating something I've learned and I've always believed in, and that is every attitude, every emotion is indeed a decision. And when you learn to control those decisions, you can control all the things Mark was talking about. But also, Mark, it's like no one can make you happy. No one can make you sad. No one can make you angry. No one can make you feel embarrassed. Those are all decisions that happen in here. And when you decide to take ownership and be a cause and not effect, you could change everything. And Mark's story is a perfect example of that. Thank you for that. That was awesome. Absolutely. And I'll add one more little uh, footnote that all these emotions are, they're, they're chemicals. They're chemicals. Everything can be quantified, measured as a type of chemical. Right. And we're chemical beings. And the chemicals are always shifting. And there are things we can do to shift those chemicals and change the emotional, literally, the, the scientific chemical response of our bodies. Yeah, absolutely. Let's go fast forward 19 years to now. Well, this is being recorded May 20th, folks, of 2014. And we're going to talk about something that Mark's got going on in July of this year. If you see this after July, there's links on this artist page for Mark on Drum Talk TV where you can click on links and see where he's doing other drum camps. He's doing something great with Bruce Becker, who's a great drumming educator, who's going to be on our show, and Daniel Glass, another friend of Drum Talk TV who's been on the show. Mark, talk about this event that you have coming up we're doing the triple threat drumming camp me and my buddies bruce and daniel bruce is actually my teacher bruce is he studied with freddie gruber for i don't know how many years but he is taking the teachings of freddie gruber and freddie is one of the greatest drum instructors he's taught steve smith um weckel neil Peart, and bruce has taken freddie's teachings and expanded upon those also the teachings of uh of, of chapin and moeller and he's a brilliant educator, and so we've decided to get together as sort of the sons of Gruber, because Daniel's also uh, a, a student of Bruce's as well as a student of Freddie's, and create this totally comprehensive drum camp. So it's not a metal camp, it's not a rock camp, it's an everything camp. And we're going to spend one day in the recording studio, either in my studio here or a drum channel, and I'm going to teach a full day of recording based on my DVD, A Day in the Recording Studio, um, because I do a lot of, I think it's a self-generated business. And Daniel is the most amazing drummer and historian. He's going to be talking all about drumming history and how you apply drumming history to making your drumming better now. And as I said, Bruce, with all of this technical, amazing expertise, it's going to be three days of so much information and so much hands-on playing. It's going to be totally interactive. And um, we're really excited about it because I can't recall as diverse of a camp as this that even I've even participated in. So I'm quite excited yeah. about it. And that's going to be July 18th, 19th, and 20th. And then I will probably be doing another camp in August or September 
with somebody else in another city, but I'm not going to talk about that yet. That's a surprise. Okay, cool. We'll definitely get with you when you're able to talk about that. We'll do another interview, bring everybody up to date with what they can tap into. That's great. Got to check my site, markshulman.com. Check the spelling is M-A-R-K-S-C-H-U-L-M-A-N.com because I'm doing drum clinics all over the place. And I may, be, I may be going to Europe and doing three clinics there, going to Australia because I've got a little break in the share tour. So I'm maximizing this stuff. And the clinics I'm doing in June are while I'm on the road with share. So I'm all over the place. So you need to check to see where I'm going to be because I'd love to be able to talk to you and, and meet people in person, especially if you're... If you happen to be viewing this, I remember drummers love drummers. We love to talk. Absolutely, yeah. And we share. We're communal. Um, sometimes uh-huh. a little too much, but uh, <laughs> uh-huh. we'll, we'll definitely get with you on that. And in the next interview, we'll talk a little bit more about touring with your experiences with Share and with Pink, with Foreigner, some other bands. Before we let you go, and I know I don't want to keep you too long, but before we let you go, it's time for a. Mark Shulman, fun fact. So I have a question for you, Mark. When flying in an airplane, how do you pass the time? Is it A, sleeping? Is it B, with a book? Is it C, music? Or D, looking for religious figures in the pattern of the upholstery of the seat in front of you? Or E, none of the above, and what would that be? A, B, and C. (laughs) Cool. Very cool. I, I, you know, so I, I, I'm, I, I'm always working on new ideas. I'm, I've, got an, I've already got the idea for my second book. So I'm always working on something. And I'm always listening to music for inspiration. And, uh, man, I love to sleep. Oh, God, whenever possible. Yeah. Yeah, you know, whenever possible, I like to sleep. Because, you know, I've got a four-year-old daughter and a beautiful wife. And, and you know, when I'm home, it's like it's full on. Yeah. That, Daddy's on the road. Daddy's on the road 75, 80% of the time. So, you know, I get my sleep when I can. And also being on the road. Well, that'll be the next interview. I'll talk to you all about being on the road. Yeah, we'll definitely do that and find out, folks, what musicians on the road really get paid for. Because it's not to play. It's for being on the road and all of that. We'll get into that in the next interview. Mark, thanks so much for joining us. I really appreciate your time. Great to connect with you again after all these years. And uh, we'll stay in touch. We'll set up another interview so we can keep people abreast with your book coming out and with the uh, new clinics that you'll be doing later in the year and anything else that you ever want to talk about. You're always welcome to come on Drum Talk TV and do that with us. Thanks, Dan. You're doing a service for the drumming community. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone, for joining Mark Shulman and myself here on this episode of Drum Talk TV. All of Mark's information has been on the screen there. Jot it down so you can tap into everything that he's doing, everything that he's offering that you can learn from and watch for more interviews with your favorite drummers, educators, and manufacturers right here on www.drumtalktv.com. Thanks, everybody. 